Hey guys, this is Stowe Bishop with Radio Rothbard, and I wanted to let you know about an exciting event we have coming up on September 23rd in Nashville, Tennessee. One of Ron Paul's favorite lines was, truth is treason and the empire of lies. Americans around the country are waking up to this reality, war across the globe, regulating free speech at home, printing trillions of dollars. The regime accepts no limits to its power. Speaking on this topic, we all have brave truth tellers, including Ted Carpenter, Michael Rechtenwald, Jonathan Newman, and many more. Again, this is on September 23rd in beautiful Nashville, Tennessee. You can find more about this event and get your tickets at Mises.org slash Nashville 23. Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm co-host here at Radio Rothbard. I'm an executive editor at the Mises Institute. And with me is my associate editor, Tho Bishop, my co-host as always. And we've got a guest this week. We've got Carrie Baldwin. Now, uh, Carrie is co-host of the Reformed Libertarians podcast with Gregory Baus. And that's all part of the Christians for Liberty Network. I met Carrie uh, through Norman Horn, who's head of the Christian Libertarians group. Um, and part of the reason I'm having Carrie on is we're doing a panel next week together at Freedom Fest on Christian nationalism uh, from a variety of different perspectives. And I just wanted to have her on so we could talk more generally about nationalism. And because uh, I don't want to just like talk about the same thing we're going to talk about next week and really just uh, let this be sort of a lead into that discussion and hopefully maybe just answer some basic questions about was the state of nationalism in terms of how do free market people, conservatives, libertarians, how do they think of nationalism? Is this something that a lot of activists think is good? How do they even define it? And is it a good thing? And I'll insert some of my own opinions about it. Um, but I'm, I don't know the answers to a lot of these questions in terms of what is the state of nationalism on the thinking of uh, activists, what Leonard Reed would used to call like freedom philosophy activists. Uh, so, uh, Carrie, let's just go ahead and get started. And when I had contacted you on this, I had said, let's just talk about a little bit about how these politicians and activists uh, seem really enthused about calling themselves nationalists in recent years. And I think it took off a little bit in uh, 2018. I mean, I, I, it's been there for a long time, right? It's a word that people invoke and think about. Um, but Trump just stood right up in 2018 and said, I'm a nationalist and uh, I'm an Americanist and I want America first. And he conflates those two things. And, and then I see in recent days, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, a, a GOP activist uh, candidate, says, uh, call me a nationalist. And then I see about a week later after that, we get, we get an online article at Real, realclearpolicy.com from a Hillsdale professor. There's lots of good people at Hillsdale, but they've definitely got sort of this uh, unionist, centralist nationalism thing going. Uh, so they've got someone named Miles Smith the fourth. They're at Hillsdale who's saying, yeah, we should all be Lincoln-style nationalists in the United States. That that's the conservative thing to do. So there's all these, uh, the term keeps coming back and we're told, yeah, nationalism is the way to a better America. And uh, I, yeah, how big of a movement is this? Is this just like people just throwing out terms, hoping they can pick up a couple extra votes? Or is this like an important strain among these sorts of people now? What do you think? Well, I would say, first of all, nationalism isn't a political philosophy. It's a sentiment. And that sentiment uh, encompasses two primary phenomenon. The first is that uh, there's an identity of a nation of people, um, and we can talk about what, you know, how you define a nation. And then second are the actions needed to achieve, sustain, or protect that national sovereignty. And <clears throat> so, really, it's a sentiment. Um, now. 
we might ask, well, what constitutes a nation? Um, in some cases, it's a common origin, it's an ethnicity. You've heard a lot of the uh, left-wing media talking about white nationalism, uh, which I think is really intended to be a pejorative that invokes uh, you know, the, the, the Nazis and, and Hitler. Um, but the, uh, a nation can also be tied together through uh, you know, common, common culture, cultural ties. And so I think what you see with these politicians is um, a lot of them, <clears throat> even, um, and I'm going to butcher his name, Ramaswamy, uh, um, you know, he calls himself a non-white nationalist, <laughs> um, which is interesting. He's obviously referencing the fact that he's not European. Uh, um, but they're, they're all appealing to this idea of um, basically uh, the American mythos, the you know, American culture, whatever that is. And the problem I would say that we are running into is that over the course of time, we've sort of lost a sense of what principles are behind the American mythos, um, what makes up American culture. Uh, the left has really done a good job at trying to totally destroy it or simply attribute it to a general democracy. And the right became super pragmatic. And, and quite frankly, we've, we've had nationalist sentiment for quite a while. It just used to be called patriotism. Right. So during the, the Bush administration, for example, um, we had nationalist sentiment uh, that was you know, aimed at protecting our national sovereignty, but it was all external to us. Right. We had to go fight all of these wars in order to protect our national sovereignty. Um, but now what I think you see uh, in the 21st century is you see a lot of uh, particular changes um, a lot of people, especially Gen X and the 80s babies, millennials, are really sick and tired of the never-ending wars. We're the, we're the generation that remembers peacetime. We grew up during peacetime. Um, American evangelicalism, which is the, uh, the, where the idea of a Christian nation has come from, that's falling apart. Um, feminism, specifically intersectional feminism and LGBTQ, is really challenging some very foundational ideas about uh, humanity itself. And our educational institutions are teaching ideas that are anti-American and really aimed at um, the new you know, globalist movement. And so what I think what, what you see, at least on the right, as far as these this nationalist sentiment is really aimed at an anti-globalist um, uh, movement. But I also get the sense that they're sort of grasping at straws for what constitutes uh, the American nation. You have many people who think that it's you know, classical liberal principles. We would certainly agree with that. There are others that um, believe that they're more Republican. That was something that uh, Murray Rothbard brought up in his book, For a New Liberty, was those were the two competing ideas at the founding. Uh, um, and you also have the left. Um, the left also has their own version of nationalism. They just couch it in terms of protecting democracy and being a good global neighbor. Um, so, you know, the the fact that the left clutches their pearls over the January 6th thing um, has to do with the fact that they are protecting our national identity as a democracy. So there's nationalism on both sides, and we've had nationalism for a while, but we've lost, I would say, a sense of what the, uh, the identity of the American nation, if you want to call it that, uh, actually is. And so you're seeing a lot of these politicians calling themselves nationalists because they want to be American, they want to pull away from this globalist ideology, but they're not really explaining what principles they, they want to defend. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point that essentially the term is, it could mean anything you want it to mean. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't, of course, mean, oh, well, we're laissez faire, so we're nationalists. Uh, you can be right. a social democrat and be a hardcore 
nationalists. Uh, look at uh, Bismarck, right? I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. it's, it's debatable as to how hardcore of a nationalist he was in terms of internal politics, but that was certainly how he played it politically, created the welfare mm -hmm. state, um, certainly, I think, paved the way for modern social democracy in many ways. Um, and yeah, the whole January 6th thing, the freaking out over January 6th, oh, they have sullied our sacred buildings right. by, yeah. by breaking it. I mean, the whole idea that, that a government building is some sort of sacred building and merging that idea with something that's actually sacred is horribly offensive, actually, and also mm -hmm. just laughable. Um, I, like, I'm going to confuse um, the Capitol building where politicians meet and seduce their male pages with, <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like an actual <laughs> holy site. Uh, right. So give me a break. And so, yeah, it doesn't mean anything in particular. And I also just noticed that almost when anybody invokes nationalism, it it just happens to coincide with the current American state, right? Mm. It, it assumes mm -hmm. that the current boundaries of the American state are correct and settled and that everybody in the, within the United States owes it to the regime to be a nationalist also and to support the regime. Maybe there's just some disagreement over what ideology should be your motivating factor. And yeah. so, so I guess you would just be hard pressed to come up with, OK, what does nationalism actually mean other than I think the U.S. government should be very active and robust and right. do a lot of things, whether it's fight against the Muslims or spread global democracy. Right. That seems to be the only right. disagreement. But we can all agree we're nationalists. Yeah, well, I would say that, um, you know, nationalism is also fundamentally a collectivist ideology because it places the community, the, the nation, the community of the nation uh, as paramount to the individual, uh, whereas individual puts, you know, we may have an affection for our communities, but the individual is paramount. Uh, um, and so it flips that. So nationalism is necessarily collectivistic. Um, it can be voluntary. So you could even have a situation where you have a nation that does not uh, have a political sovereignty like a nation state, and they are voluntary. Um, so you could even have an anarchist community that is nationalist um, that, you know, but they maintain, you know, a, a, a voluntary membership, so to speak, in that community. So there is that. But right now, I think what you have is people freaking out on both sides and people wanting to protect something about America that they believe to be part of its identity, whether it's democracy on the left or, um, you know, Christian culture on the right. And so they are appealing to uh, this idea that we need to put the collective over the individual so that uh, we can save you know the, the the american nation the american mythos whatever whatever they think that is and, and perhaps you know, in some ways the most powerful form of nationalism in the modern sense really has been kind of voluntary in nature i mean it's a lot more fr you know, frivolous than some of these other definitions but when we think about common traditions common histories common stories that unite people you know across the country in some places parts of the world you know NFL nationalism <laughs> is one, you know, with, within a, a modern sense where so much of our, you know, political distinctions have become homogenized around the country. So much of our cultural distinctions have become homogenized over time. You know, churches obviously have played played this role as well um, in, a, in a more serious uh, environment. And I, I think that you're, you're absolutely right, Carrie. Where you know, nationalism in the current sense is more of a vibe than a platform. And I think one of the interesting dynamics within the current political sense is the degrees to which people are trying to create larger intellectual projects around this notion of nationalism. Mm -hmm. And this is where you get um, Christian nationalism on the rise as a topic of interest, usually used as a pejorative, but you have, ha you have people like Stephen Wolf that have tried to do a more serious, um, positive position on what Christian nationalism is, which is it's itself a reaction to secular progressive cultural jihads of their own right, right. 
Um, you, you have economic nationalists that are trying to pursue a platform there. Um, you know, the, the Hillsdale article is very just kind of boomerific, you know, go, oh, well, Lincoln's good guy, and so therefore we should be all be like Lincoln. I mean, there's not a lot of substance there, though. It's very interesting to uh, ascribe to the early Republicans a, a platform of capitalist uh, reforms throughout the country. I, I, I think uh, Tom DeLorenzo, among others, would have some, some arguments with that historical analysis. Yeah. And so someone like, like, a, like a Vivek Ramaswamy, his vibe is anti-globalist, anti-spooky, you know, great reset stuff. Uh, but I, I think, you know, one of the, 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 the beauties and, and of just like Rothbard's analysis of, the, of, of American history, um, some of the themes that, that Ryan and I talk a lot about is that, you know, with, within that American historical project, you know, respect for like the Jacksonian tradition, which was, you know, you could argue, you know, Christian anti-federalist rather than Christian nationalist. In many ways, if you know, for those that are seriously interested, I think particularly within the American context, which has always been, or at least was was a, a profoundly distinct um, number of cultures and nations within, you know, this this collective political agreement, um, you know, that's that's I, I think a far richer tradition for those seeking, however you want to define, you know, conservative, you know, whatever their terms are. Um, you know, that's, that's that aspect of American history that is often overlooked by some of these modern projects. And I don't think they're necessarily always bad will projects. I, 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 I think Wolf is a, is, I, well, I disagree with his larger project, particularly because of nationalism as a centralizing force within American history. I think he's trying to do a goodwill effort and trying to combat some of the real problems that we have culturally, mm -hmm. um, but without a respect for some of those overlooked aspects of American history, the sense of what nationalism is for an American um, can be uh, can get distorted and towards kind of serving the the ends of the regime that has done most more than anything to uh, destroy some of those more uh, uh, meritocratic notions of of American nationalism. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really important to understand the importance of culture and where it comes from. Um, you know, culture is something that that we create. That's actually. In essence, that's what we're creating when when we participate in economic activities. We're creating culture, uh, um, but when you lose a sense of what that culture is and how you identify uh, um, with your culture, then you uh, that's like that's losing that's like losing a sense of your own identity. And if you don't know who you are, right? If you don't know who you belong to, um, then it's very easy to feel and get lost in a whirlwind of of other people with other identities with other ideas and not know where to go there's nothing grounding there um so i do think it's very very important that we you know have these conversations about okay well what is american national identity what does that mean what are the principles that we want to protect and that's a perfect opportunity for libertarians and um, Austrian economists to say, these are the ideas we want to protect, right? These, these are American ideas. They're, you know, older than American ideas, but they were certainly there at the founding. And these are the things that we want to protect. And there's nothing wrong with, um, saying that you want America as a nation to uphold those ideas. Um, and certainly the resistance to the globalist communist agenda is, is incredibly important too. So, you know, there's there's that. But national identity, identity in general, it's not a coincidence that gender identity politics is so hot right now. Um, and it has a great, uh, it, it has to do a lot with the fact that people have lost a sense of who they are. And uh, that's been torn down, I would say, by a lot of not just political rhetoric, but politicizing absolutely everything under the sun and letting the government define those things for us and tell us this is what you do if you believe you're American, you go kill Muslims over in the Middle East. Or if you believe you're a good American, you're going to um, you know, sell your, your gasoline <laughs> car and start riding a bike, right? We've been told what to believe about our identity for a very long time, and now we have no sense of what it is. It seems the only good time that I hear someone invoke nationalism is when they contrast it with a global regime, 
right? Yeah. So right. when when nationalism functions as a break on uh, an EU continent-wide empire, I think that's mm -hmm. good. If American nationalism is invoked uh, to uh, oppose some sort of global order, I think that's good. Although the U.S. pretty much runs the global order, so I, right. I, I mean, the U.S. dominates the World Bank, the U.N., all of those international organizations. So I'm somewhat suspicious, actually, when people talk about how the U.S. needs to assert itself. It already asserts itself greatly. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what and that's what the neoconservative new American century was all about. Um, was spreading American democracy across the world. Right. Um, and that was in the interest of protecting our, our national sovereignty. So. And so to the extent that national sovereignty uh, breaks up the world uh, into a more decentralized system, then it can be good. Uh, right. The problem you encounter then is as soon as you start speaking of maybe more local nationalism, where your nationalism doesn't coincide with the nation state as it currently exists, then people go bonkers. And yeah. you can look at what nationalism meant historically uh, in the West, which was to destroy local loyalties, local languages, local uh, culture, mm -hmm. and to merge it in the larger state. And I think France is probably the best example of that, how in the 18th and 19th century, especially after the revolution, France engaged in an explicit policy of suppressing local languages, forcing everyone to go to federal or nationally. They never had a federal system, a nationally regulated education system, um, and just to Frenchify everybody. Mm -hmm. And by French, they meant the values of the Parisians. Mm -hmm. And so that was what nationalism meant uh, for them. And I think that's often the model that they employ is that, well, if you're and yeah. look at how the Spaniards absolutely freaked out when the Catalonians started talking about uh, having some sort of independence. And they used, by the way, nationalist as a slur when mm -hmm. uh, the Spaniard unionists would contact me and tell us we were wrong about secession. They would use the you could tell that they were using the word nationalist as a insult. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure why Catalonian self-rule is nationalist, but Spanish self-rule from Madrid isn't nationalist. I'm not sure. They didn't make any real meaningful distinction there. Um, so yeah. again, we're back at the issue how that the term doesn't really mean anything specific. I just right. define it to well, support my position. Let me, let me give you another example. I, uh, I live in New Mexico. I'm born and raised here. And um, so something that is very much a part of our culture is Native American culture. And, you know, the Native Americans uh, were a, a, a number of, of nations that were squashed by the U.S. federal government. Um, and, try, you know, the, the, the federal government really wanted to get them to um, m meld, <laughs> you might say, into an American culture. And they, interestingly, they... They took one tact, which was to try to remove their culture from them, right? Take their language, uh, um, re-educate re them as far as a more European style um, education and forbid them from, from practicing their culture. That changed in about, I want to say, the 1960s, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, I want to say it was about the 1960s when... Uh, the government figured out that that was not working. <laughs> it, they, they were not able to uh, maintain control over the Na Native American population. And so what they did instead was to say, well, we're going to now protect your culture. We're going to be your safe haven for your culture. And they've ingratiated Native American populations uh, into the government so that they understand that the government uh, is there to protect their culture. And if you uh, drive up in the Jemez Mountains in New Mexico, you have to drive through the Jemez Pueblo. There's one way in and one way out. When you drive through the Jemez Pueblo, it looks like you're driving through a third world nation. You get into the canyon, there's this small little town called Jemez Springs. It is not on the reservation, and they have a thriving economy. And there's no reason in the world why the Jemez Pueblo should be looking like a third world nation, which, by the way, they were only released from COVID lockdown at the beginning of this year. So, um, 
you know, protecting culture, protecting our national identity, I think is important, but we need to be careful about what that means. We don't want a monopolistic government to be the one in charge of that. Yeah, I mean, we could point out, uh, it's interesting that you bring up New Mexico, too, because that's just an interesting case on many levels, right? It's not even just the mm -hmm. indigenous population. Uh, <laughs> part of the reason New Mexico didn't become a state uh, more than a decade, I believe. Maybe it was 1911 when uh, New Mexico became a it was state? 1912. Okay. Yeah. And part of the reason, uh, my understanding, is that they wanted to make sure that English uh, was the majority language in New Mexico before they made it a state and that there was a sufficient elite Anglo-Saxon rancher class that was in place uh, before they gave state powers there because they didn't want all these what they used to call greasers when they referred to mm -hmm. Mexican Americans. Um, they didn't want those people running things. And right. so that delayed statehood quite a bit. So the question is, well, what is this American culture then, right? New Mexicans who are clearly Americans, they didn't have the right culture apparently. Well, and, and uh, quite frankly, if you look at our demographics now, um, white non-Hispanics, uh, you know, which are basically European, not Spanish, um, are a minority. We, we are a minority here. Um, our constitution is bilingual. Um, and New Mexican is its own culture. It's an amalgamation of Native American, Mexican, American, West, and Spanish. And um, so it, it's interesting to see how that played out, even though, you know, statehood was delayed because they wanted it to be, you know, a European culture. It didn't work itself out like that. Um, so but you can see it, how nationalism works in cases like that because you mm -hmm. don't I don't I haven't heard it lately firsthand from people but in the past when the issue of a national language would come up often in the context I suppose of immigration where yeah. uh, you, you'll hear people say ridiculous things like a country has to have one single national language or they'll be constantly in a state of civil war and strife um, and, you know, never mind the Swiss or the Belgians or the Canadians, uh, all of which right. have multiple languages in use at any given time. But many people believe you have to have a national language and, and people have to be united um, by force if necessary. Uh, and if the, the court, one of the things that gets right is the federal government has no prerogative, no power to create a national language. Um, right. But that's something that nationalists have wanted for quite some time, because nationalism often is just about conformity and uniformity. And right. that's, that's, of course, then requires power of the nation state, of the state apparatus in general, to be stronger in many yeah. cases. Yeah, and I think it, it's in the case of Christian nationalism, I think you definitely see um, that there is this... Uh, First of all, it's very easy when everybody shares the same fundamental values that you do, right? It's very, very easy to become complacent. And one thing that I see from Christian nationalists is that they are looking at the culture and they're saying, oh gosh, this is, this is not a Christian culture anymore. This is a pagan culture. We don't want to live in a pagan culture. And so we're going to promote Christian nationalism. And it it raises a question about one about how cultures are formed uh is it through force or is it through um you know spontaneous order and why is it that you want to promote that culture is it simply because you fear living in a culture that you're unfamiliar with or is there something else and i think in the case of christian nationalists it has more to do with fear than anything else that's my experience as well, very much so. Um, and I think that's the impulse behind uh, the Benedict Option, the book, mm -hmm. um, and uh, which I can more freely badmouth now because Rod Dreyer is <laughs> such a such a weird, uh, unreliable, manic guy that you don't want to t you don't want to take his word too much <laughs> on anything. But I think the overall idea of the book is fine, right? That you need to create mm -hmm. your own communities and cultures. But most of the people I know who think a lot of, in those terms and quote the book a lot, they're just deathly afraid of the larger mm -hmm. culture, breaking up their family and things like that. They seem less concerned with building up something and thinking they're on the winning side and more, to and more with like a rear guard retreat seems to be their mode of thought. Right. 
which, I mean, why be Christian if you think you're on the losing side? I mean, it just <laughs> seems kind of weird. Yeah. Well, well, and it, it also misses the point that other cultures um, have their, their own, uh, you might say, comparative advantages, right? Uh, um, Native American populations, for example, have uh, a very good idea, or at least their tradition has a very good idea about how to protect the environment, and it doesn't require communism. Uh, um, so, you know, it's unfortunate that one of the things that national nationalism does is sort of, in, you know, causes you to withdraw from uh, those people who are not like you. It's one thing to protect your culture. It's another thing to completely withdraw and isolate yourself from other cultures that if we actually interacted with them and shared with them, then that, you know, that, that raises the cultures of, of everybody, that raises the quality of life for everybody. And of course, you can be comfortable in your own national group. Let's just take mm -hmm. someone who's Finnish or Norwegian. Um, they have their own traditions. They're, they've got their own country. They're fine with that. They're not trying to merge them with other countries. But at the same time, they certainly don't close their borders to trade, uh, refrain right. from engagement with the larger world, anything like that. And these countries are much, much smaller, much, much more ethnically uniform, mm -hmm. certainly more linguistically uniform, which actually I would agree is part of the main problem that Americans have is the, the, the country is just so huge, encompasses so many different cultures that it's really hard to figure out, well, what does it even mean to be American once you right. start to get away from the idea that the U.S. is a union of, of a variety of different places and polities that act together for specific purposes. Instead, people try to impose this common culture on the whole thing. That Lincoln mm -hmm. idea, right? Is right. We, we can't just have a bunch of people with different ideas living in the same country. Everything has to be made uniform and we all have to agree on stuff. And, yeah. and I noticed that Miles um, or Miles Smith in that article says some issues are too large to be left to states and local governments. That's exactly what the left says about everything, right? right? This is a matter of national concern. It's too important to be left to the local rubes to run things right. themselves. And so it's, again, that, that unitary impulse. But, the, mm -hmm. but I think the big question is, and this keeps coming up in the discussion here, is people, they want to identify with some sort of group, right? Mm -hmm. And like a healthy society has lots of different groups that people are members of and identify with. And only like those super weird libertarian types think that society can just be a bunch of individualists all living in the middle of nowhere with a dog and 50 guns. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to join anything. I don't want to be part of anything. People are jerks. I hate people. I, I don't want to, you know, forget that. And of course, religion is stupid. Any sort of anything that you might, a larger uh, thing that you might be part of and believe in, it's just no good. But that's not how mm -hmm. most of humanity functions, right? And so right. I think the national, this idea of I need to be part of a nation with other people, that's building on an impulse that people naturally have. But it's a new thing. It's pretty darn modern in terms of, hey, I'm in this yeah. nation and I, me and this guy who lives 2000 miles away in New York City, who I've never met and never will meet and probably never even be within 50 miles of, we've all got this thing in common and we call it being American. That is like so abstract. That is so way down like the abstraction rabbit hole. Um, mm -hmm. and, but in the past, if you, if you look at the work of uh, Benedict Anderson, he's got he's kind of considered one of the, I don't know, the founding fathers of scholarship on nationalism. And he's got a book called Imagine Communities. And he looks at other ways of of organizing society. Right. You've got the city state where there's a natural feeling of unity among people who inhabit the same physical space and are much more close to be on like a face-to-face -face relationship at some level, Look, a city of 100,000 people, say. Um, mm -hmm. Or people historically, they were unified by some sort of common religious belief um, rather than idea of nationhood, and it's very different. Or uh, you had the idea of family association, which extended in, well into the Middle Ages, which was, okay, we're in progressive concentric circles of relationship. Um, 
we are related somehow to the dynasty that rules over us, perhaps, um, or to the local lord, that sort of thing. There was some, there was a familial relationship in many cases. Nationalism is totally different from all of that. So what should, so these are all different ways people can organize their society and think in terms of, I belong to something. How should people do that? If we're going to say, well, nationalism has a lot of drawbacks and big problems and probably isn't ideal, okay, then what should, how should we be organizing ourselves and, and thinking of ourselves in terms of group identity? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because I think that the, the, the hyper culture war dynamic that we're in, a lot of which is pushed explicitly by various mechanisms of the federal government when it comes into um, some of the really strong enforcement and subsidization side of it, you're, you're seeing a, you know, a, a federal realignment within, or a federalist realignment within the country where people are, you know, moving with their feet, you know, whether it's because, of, I mean, obviously COVID played a, a big role on that, which is not quite a cultural issue, but still a reaction to federal overreach. Um, the, 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 you know, whether it's, you know, the parent parental rights uh, legislation is drawing people in or sometimes pushing people out. I, one of my favorite business models I saw out there was a, a very concerned progressive realtor that will help uh, Texas, family, or te Texas LGBTQ uh, couples uh, be become refugees and, and resettle in more tolerant parts of the state, which I, I need to find some realtors here in Florida that will help uh, bring that business model here. <laughs> Um, but people are, are, are realigning themselves, because, you know, and unfortunately, it's, it's not being driven by a larger appreciation for Florida culture, per se, or Florida history, or, or, or a religious uh, 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 it, it attempt to get closer to, to clo more reliable, uh, more common religious groups. Um, but it is a reaction to various political projects that, are, that have gone on the last several years here in the United States. And yet at the same time, while you have this very clear um, activity with, with millions of people resettling over political dynamics, um, at the same time you have federal, the, the federal court system um, that is preventing and holding up a lot of attempts by states to respond to these concerns. You know, it's federal courts that have stopped uh, you know, bans on minor gender mutilation um, procedures um, you know, in Mississippi and Florida and a few other states, you've seen um, crackdowns on some of the attempts on, uh, you know, what is taught in schools and things like that. And so even though you have, you know, a, a very, you know, interesting voluntary dynamic in terms of people moving with their feet, trying to get into political bodies that more represent their underlying values, the federal government is, is not giving way there. Now we'll see some of these cases will obviously go to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is acting a little bit differently on the, the higher level um, than some of the, the court, uh, the, the, the circuit courts and things like that. It's, gonna, it's a whole larger interesting conversation about the makeup of the, the lower federal courts right now. Um, but I, I think it does represent the federal government's recognition that there is a growing uh, restriction and, and a pushback to some of the more heavy handed, particularly cultural um, and liberty issues that the feds have perpetrated. And you know, is that going to lead to the feds continuing to crack down? I mean, that's obviously in their incentive to do. Um, is it gonna lead to states you know, embracing, you know, red states embracing a more you know, nullification um, style tactic that the left has used to win their own battles in, the, in recent years? Um, you know, that will be interesting to see uh, play out there because obviously the tension you know, the, the idea that Americans all share the same values has never been more, you know, farciful now than it ever has been before. And, and part of that, you know, perhaps is the breakdown of cultural homogeneity, where, you know, you, we're not all watching the same news sources. We're not even watching the same TV shows and movies like we used to. There are very few um, even cultural uh, landmarks that we can all gather around the water cooler and talk about no matter what our political beliefs are. You know, even, you know, you know what we, what we watch on the weekends is directly, you know, has a lot of correlation with, with our political beliefs in this environment right now. And so we, we are very much, I think, within a, a, a nationalist, a, a anti, a, an anti-federalist sort of you know, kind of a throwback American um, respect for federalism um, that the American nation state is very much wanting to, to crank down. Um, and we'll see if they're successful in that. Yeah, I, th I, I just want to add to that. I think it's important to understand that um, 
the government wants to be the arbiter of everything cultural because that means that they can you know that they can stick their fingers in absolutely everything that we do and the the culture is protected really by individuals and so an an american identity must be defined broadly and conceptually um, in such a way that it leaves people free to particularize their not just their personal identity but their family identity their you know the other group identities that they would associate with whether that that's you know a, a particular christian denomination or even a different religion or you know the fact that they're you know, outdoorsy or whatever, then they're in a community of hikers or, you know, what, whatever the case is, the, the government um, should, should have the least amount of say in defining what, um, what those particularities are. Um, and I would say, I'll just, um, uh, I'll, I'll just give to, a nod to my co-host Gregory Baus on this. He talks a lot about a concept about uh, called sphere, sphere sovereignty. Um, which talks about the relationship of civil governance to other communities. Uh, um, so, you know, business, family, relig- you know, church, that sort of thing. And um, it, I think it's one thing that it does is it, it helps to take away this idea that the state is the thing that homogenizes everything or should have control over everything. Um, and, and breaks it down and says, nope, civil governance is just one part of, of the overall society. Um, and it's, it's not the, the guarantor or the protector of, of culture. All of these things contribute to creating culture. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap up with that then for this episode of Radio Rothbard. And I uh, will see Carrie next week, and we'll talk more specifically about Christian nationalism. Uh, next week at Freedom Fest. So join us there uh, if you uh, happen to be in Memphis for that event. And so thank you, Tho. Thank you, Carrie, for joining me this time. And so for you uh, listening out there, we'll be back next week with another episode, and we'll see you next time. Hey.